Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Uh, what we are going to see today is the basic echo views. I understand that you had a session on the principles of uh, echo in the last uh, week and the beginning of this week. So this is a follow-up for uh, echo classes. And the first session is going to be the basic echo views. We're just going to see um, what echo views we take and what structures do we see, what are the principles behind that, how do we determine what is uh, right, left, what is uh, interior, posterior, what is superior, inferior. So the relationship between the structures, etc. I hope at the end of the session we are clear about it. We just uh, uh, brush in a very little about uh, how to ensure an image quality uh, in echo. The first most important is to select an appropriate transducer frequency. And as we understand that, uh, based on the frequency, the depth and the clarity gets affected. The second most important thing is uh, decide the degree of magnification. Now, in general, you need to have a picture which is two-thirds of the whole screen. Anything less or anything more, you might compromise on the quality. The third most important is centering of the structures. Decide which structure you want to focus on, and you can reduce the width of the picture or sometimes even uh, use the zoom button to some extent, not compromising on the quality. And the last is use focus depth. We have certain machines which gives one and certain machines which give two focus depth. That means that your clarity is going to be the best where that cursor is lying. The most important other than these things in pediatric population is the comfort of the child. Make sure the child is comfortable, not anxious, and the position is correct, like uh, you can turn the child to the left lateral position for a pikel and parastinal windows. And for subcostal, you can make the child fold his legs and make the abdomen a little loose. Now, with this understanding, the next uh, important uh, concept in pediatric echocardiography is we need to demonstrate structures in correct anatomic orientation, unlike the adult cardiologists. The adult views are usually taken upside down in subcostals and apical, but in pediatrics, it's not that way because we deal with children with heart uh, problems, which are more complex. We want to see the heart in a way it looks like exactly. Uh, so always demonstrate structures in correct anatomic uh, orientation with the apex to the bottom of the heart. This is for subcostals and apical views. Uh, the in this view, we can see that the structures which are uh, anterior and superior are at the top of the screen. So this is superior, this is inferior. And usually, the right and the left is this way. The right, so, right, right, rightward structures are placed on the left side of the screen. And the left side structures are on the right side of the screen. However, parasitic long axis is an exception. And as we proceed through the slides, we will understand this a little more clearer. What we are going to see in this short talk is the most important is the imaging planes and the views. And then we go into the individual views with 2D and color, and then a little understanding on M mode and Doppler. It's going to be very basics of, of a normal heart. The first is the imaging plane. Now, how do we decide which plane uh, do we take? So there are three ways how we define the imaging plane. One is based on the plane of examination. The second is based on the anatomic plane. And the third is based on the transducer location. The most important is the plane of examination related to the heart. Remember that this is in relation to the heart and not in relation to the body. So if we see the heart in this way, we can see that there are three planes, X, Y, and Z. So this is one plane, this is another plane, and this is the third plane. So we can see this. This is one plane, which is the uh, long axis of the heart, and this is the short axis of the heart, and this is across the heart. So if we use terms like sagittal coronal, then we can understand that this cutting is the sagittal cutting. And this cutting is the coronal cutting, whereas this is the axial cut or the short axis. So there are multiple ways to define a particular view. However, 
the one related to the heart is more well accepted. So now let's see what is this related to the heart. When we see short axis, short axis is going to be an axial cut. We cut across the axial section of the heart. And the long axis is exactly perpendicular to it. That means that we have this across the axis of the heart. This is the long axis. And then what we see here is the four chamber view. If we only have the left upper chamber, left lower chamber, then it's going to be the two chamber. Now let us see in this. This is one plane and this is another plane. So what we cut in this way is going to be the long axis and what we cut in this way is going to be the four chamber. So in general we have the four chamber, the long axis, the short axis or the coronal, sagittal and axial section. So the anatomic planes can be defined as sagittal, coronal, parasagittal next to the sagittal and transverse. Transverse is axial. Also that based on the transverse location we can name it as subcostal, apical, parasternal and suprasternal. If we go to the right sternal then it's right parasternal. So it's subcostal, apical, right parasternal, left parasternal and suprasternal. So now with these terminologies in mind, we will see the way we start doing our echoes. Now the first most important position is the subcostal. Subcostal gives us more than 80% of information in pediatrics and we have a reasonable understanding of the diagnosis by the time we finish the subcostal view. Subcostal, we put the transducer this way first. Now in this again, here we can see that this is the coronal subcostal view. Coronal in the sense that it's going to cut the heart in a coronal section with the transducer to the right side. Transducer to the right side in the sense it's our right side or baby's left side. So you can see here the transducer is on the baby's left and it is put horizontally for the coronal subcostal. And this is how the heart is going to cut. Now when we do this, it's not a single still image. And what we are going to do is to sweep. And we're going to sweep using the tail down and tail up. Because of which you're going to cut it in multiple planes. And this is how in multiple planes it gets cut. Now what we see is this. Starting with the subcostal coronal, we can see the diaphragms. Now remember that whenever we are doing an echo, we should not concentrate only on the heart, but also pay attention to the surrounding structures. Diaphragm is one most important structure where you can see that you see both the domes of diaphragm. So now, okay, so we were talking about the diaphragms and we start our sweep from the level of uh, diaphragms and we play it once again. And you can see here, Okay, so what we see, see is diaphragms and the domes of diaphragms are important, especially in post-operative scenario where we could uh, see uh, whether the movements of diaphragms are affected or not. Second most important thing is to look for any collection which is there in terms of pleural effusion here or sometimes even sub-diaphragmatic collections we can see well. Children with congenital diaphragmatic hernia, so you happen to do an echo in the NICO, sometimes congenital diaphragmatic hernia will also uh, make you understand that continuity is not there. Now, in addition to that, you can see two small structures here, the one to the left of the vertebral column. So the vertebral col column comes here, and the one to the left is the descending aorta, and the one to the right is the inferior vena cava. So normally, the IVC is to the right and the aorta is to the left, both on either side of the midline. And you can see the liver texture below the diaphragm. So this is the liver and what you're going to do is tail down. So as you keep entering the heart, you sweep and your sweep is from posterior to anterior. 
So the movement of the probe brings the structures from the posterior aspect of the heart to the anterior aspect of the heart. What you see, this side is the right side and this is the left side, the left-sided structures, and this is the superior, this is the inferior. So in this view, I think it's quite clear we are very much into a physiological or the anatomical way the heart looks like. And we start again, we don't see the diaphragm and the IVC. Now, if I go back a little, and if you keep tracing that IVC, you saw that it's entering into the right side of the right-sided atrium. And here we can see the SVC. So the SVC and the IVC hepatic veins are entering the right-sided atrium. You can see these pulmonary veins. The pulmonary veins are entering the roof of left-sided atrium. Now, how do we define that it's not a TAPVC? It's defined because more than, uh, more than one vein is entering directly into the left-sided atrium. What you see in between is the interatrial septum. So the interatrial septum, left atrium, right atrium, the AV valve this side, the mitral valve, the AV valve this side is the tricuspid valve, and as you come interior, you open up the ventricles, the left ventricle and the right ventricle, and then you see the aorta and the pulmonary artery. Now, we need to understand that how do we decide which is aorta and which is the pulmonary artery. The aorta has a more thick wall, and it's pulsatile, the arterial pulsations, and whereas the IVC is a thin wall with venous pulsations. So this is an addition very important to understand because when you want to see what a site is ambiguous, this is important to define. If you have IVC interruption, this area will be completely blank. And then as we go in, we can see that we lose the aorta and then the IVC is draining. Here, the SVC is here. The structure which is ne next to the SPC is going to be the right pulmonary artery. So the pulmonary artery and the pulmonary veins should not be confused. The pulmonary veins are entering into the left atrium. The right pulmonary artery is just anterior to the pulmonary vein. So when you're sweeping, the first thing you'll see is the pulmonary vein, and then you see the pulmonary artery. This is the pulmonary artery. <clears throat> These are the pulmonary veins. This is one view which shows you very well the posterior aspect of the interatrial septum. So any defect which is there in the posterior aspect of the interatrial septum is well seen in subcostals. And after that, <clears throat> The two AV valves are seen very nicely. The tricuspid valve hugs the septum, so it is septophilic. It likes the septum, whereas the mitral valve is septophobic. It is always away from the septum. This view is important to ensure that your mitral valve is not a part of a common AV valve or is not straddling and overriding. The second thing is the offset, which you can very nicely visualize. Offset is the uh, difference between the mitral and the tricuspid. If I can freeze it and show you. So you can see here this structure. So this is the structure between the right atrium and the left ventricle, which is called pars atrioventricularis. This is a part of the perimembranous septum or the membranous septum, which has two parts. The membranous septum is between the LV and the RV and between the RA and the LV, atrioventricular and interventricular. And this is the place where if you have a leakage or a shunt, subcostal, this position will show a LV to RA shunt. And the rest of the part is the membranous septum. And as you go, when you see the AV valves, the part is the inlet septum. And then the rest of the part is the mus trabecular septum. Now, as you go interiorly, you're opening the aortic valve. The septum below is the subaortic area. And this is the final pulmonary valve. And the septum below is the subpulmonic area. And the trabecular septum along with that becomes anterior trabecular septum. So I think this is uh, quite satisfactorily understood. We can go back anytime at the end if you uh, feel like seeing any image once again. So now with this understanding, we, uh, we see what is there on color for us. Again, I will uh, pull the original image.
And we can see here the pulsatility. I will freeze it so that we know the aorta. This is the IEC and this is the aorta. So as you saw, the aorta has pulsatile and the, v, the, the IVC has a smooth flow. With the SVC entering into the right atrium, the pulmonary veins entering into the left atrium, the interatrial septum being intact, no AV valve regurgitation and no mitral stenosis, mild tricuspid regurgitation, and then the aorta coming from the LV and the PA coming from the RV. Now, whatever structures we spoke about it at, in the uh, previous slide, we double check everything on color Doppler. Now, at the same time, you can see this pulsatility. This is what is very important for us. Make sure your IVC and hepatic veins are all together entering into the right side of the atrium. So with this understanding, what we are going to do is we're going to shift back. So we're going to shift back to our slide and what happens next is we're going to rotate the probe 90 degrees. So this is where the probe comes. We rotated the probe 90 degrees clockwise. So your cursor was facing towards the left side of the patient. Now the cursor is towards the umbilicus. And you hold the probe like this in this plane. So what is this going to do? This is going to cut the heart in a sagittal section. Sagittal cuts are going to be there at a particular plane and then we're going to sweep from left to right, I'm sorry, left to right and then come back. Now remember all sweeps when we are doing in echo, you should start from a particular index point, go till the end, come back to your index point. So this is what is going to ensure a double check for every single thing on 2D and then you will repeat your sweeps on color in a similar way. So this is where the cursor is towards the umbilicus and you start at a particular point and your cuts are going to be in the sagittal way and your sweep is going to be from uh, left, right to left and come back again to right side. So we will see the image now. So now we start in this view. This is the sagittal cut. This is the sagittal cut and what we are starting is with the SVC and the IVC. Always remember in this view, it's important for you to make the heart stand. Your heart should not lie down. Your heart should be standing. So that superior structures are superior. Inferior structures are inferior. So now let's see. So we see this IVC and the eustachian valve is beautifully seen. This is the SVC. So this is the SVC, IVC view or the sagittal cut. Now in this, we are sweeping from the right side of the patient to the left side of the patient. And because it's a sagittal cut, you can see that there is one end which is going to be anterior and this is posterior. So this is anterior, this is posterior, this is superior, this is inferior, and your sweep is from the right side of the baby to the left side of the baby. And what we are starting to see is the So the SVC is seen entering here and the IVC is seen entering here. The hepatic veins in the IVC are entering through the same opening. The eustachian valve is seen here guarding the mouth of IVC. This is the left atrium which is posterior. The right atrium relatively is anterior. The right pulmonary artery comes as a cross section next to the SVC here. What you see next to the SVC here is the right atrial appendage. This is very, very important. If your SVC looks blunt, then the right atrial appendage is not present here. That means what? It's present to the left side, which is known as left juxtaposition of the right atrial appendage. And then we start sweeping. Now, before we go to the left of the baby, always remember that you see the right upper pulmonary vein here. Don't lose it. Go little to the right of SVC, you will see the right upper pulmonary vein. And then keep going to the left of the child or towards the apex of the heart. So what you're at the end of it seeing is the LV apex. Go till the apex so that you don't miss any muscular VSDs. And come back again all the way to the SVC IVC view. And this is something which is important for all of you to understand the right upper pulmonary vein, which I will try to freeze and scroll and see.
So here, this is where you will get the right upper pulmonary vein next to the SVC. This is important. So go to right of the baby a little bit and then start sweeping. What you're seeing here is the tricuspid valve. The tricuspid valve and the right ventricle. As you go towards the left of the baby, you'll open up the aortic valve and then the pulmonary valve, the LV and the RV. Now, the interventricular septum, what we are seeing below the pulmonary valve is the outlet septum. Any suppalmonic VSD, you will see there. And the rest of the septum is going to be trabecular, but in different planes. The trabecular septum is right till the apex. And so you are seeing the anterior, the posterior, the superior, the inferior, different aspects of the trabecular septum, which we will see more nicely in the parasitic short axis. The tricuspid valve is seen opening like that, and the mitral valve is seen typically like a fish mouth opening. The fish mouth opening of the mitral valve not touching the septum is normally an ideal mitral valve. You see the right pulmonary artery here. And a little sweep from the IVC to the left, we will see the descending aorta. So always remember that in the sagittal cut, you try to focus on the descending aorta and take a Doppler. We will see the Doppler pattern in a little while later. Now here you can see the whole right ventricle and the right ventricle has three parts. It has the inlet, body and the outlet. So this view is the view where you can see all three parts, the inlet, the body and the outlet. And especially important uh, for us is to understand the crista supraventricularis, which we will see in a little modified view next. So coming back from this to what we see on color now is just double checking everything what we, sorry, just double checking what we see on 2D is the IVC. Make sure IVC is patent. IVC is not interrupted. The hepatic veins are entering together along with the SVC. And then we sweep all the way to the apex to make sure there are no VSDs and then come back. The pulmonary veins, which are seen very well here, are the right upper, the right middle, very well. And the left-sided veins are not that well seen in this view. So now we will go to one modified view, which is actually uh, not commonly described. However, I find it very important for lots of uh, uh, things, especially uh, where children have right-sided uh, disease. And this is a little modified view where you put your cursor towards the left shoulder of the baby. And what you will get is a little modified view of the subcostal coronal view. And here you can see that you open up the right atrium, the right ventricle, and the outflow tract very well. In this view, you can see the muscle bundles in the RV. So what are the muscle bundles in the RV commonly we see? They are the parietal muscles, the infundibular, the septal, and the moderator. So here you can see that the thing which separates the RV cavity from the outflow tract, this area is the crista supraventricularis. That is something which defines the position of separation of the subpulmonic and the subaortic VSDs or supracrystal and infracrystal. This view is also very important because you open up the aortic valve and the outflow tract. So the ventricular septal defects can be separated from the RVOT muscle bundle uh, gradients. So this view is very nice to separate these two things. This is a little modified view from the coronal. You put the cursor towards the left shoulder. And on color, in the similar view, the modified subcostal coronal, you can see here this is the aorta and this is the RV outflow tract. So the VSDs in the outlet septum and the RVOT muscle bundle gradients can be separated very well in this view. And you can separately see your crista supraventricularis. The pulmonary arteries, the one which runs closer to the heart is the right, and the one which goes away from the heart is the left pulmonary artery. So you know, this is a practically the end of the subcostals. And now the next, we move upwards and then we put, put our probe in the apical position. So now what we see in the apical position, so we can look at this figure, we put the probe at the apex of the baby's heart, a little manipulation right and left might be needed based on the uh, anatomical problem with the baby. But in general, if you turn the baby to the left lateral position, it will help keeping the heart in contact with the probe and giving you better pictures. And here you can see the cursor is towards the left of the baby. So now with this understanding, 
we can see that the heart is cut in short of a not typical long axis but a four chamber view and then you will sweep from anterior to posterior or posterior to anterior with your tail down and tail up. So here the structures to the right are right, structures to the left are left and superior structures are superior, inferior structures are inferior. In a way this is I think very similar to our subcostal coronal. Now when we start with this we will call this as an apical four chamber view because it cuts the heart in a four chamber and sweep is from anterior to posterior. Chamber. Just a second. Now what we are doing is we are getting a four chambered heart. So in a way this is different than a long axis because we are cutting heart into four chambers. So this is this would define it as a four chamber view or the apical view. And this is an important view because uh, this is the only view where we can see the interatrial and the interventricular septum in the same plane. So you can see the IAS and IVS in the same plane sort of align and all four chambers are seen together. All four chambers are seen together. And again here, the interatrial septum is actually parallel to the uh, beam of the light which the probe gives. Because of which the defects in the interatrial septum can be falsely positive in the sense that there is no ASD, you will still see an ASD. Remember, do not come in finally only on an apical view for an ASD. Go back to your subcostals and double check its presence. What else can we see are the pulmonary veins here. The pulmonary veins, we can see the right sided upper middle and the left sided most of the times the two join together and enter as a single into the left atrium. We can see the offset very well. The mitral valve attachment and the tricuspid valve attachment is not at the same level, which is important. Offset is important for a normal heart. Again, defining your atrioventricular component. The interatrial septum. Actually, as you go back, you can see that we are seeing a structure running at the floor of the left atrium, which is the coronary sinus, this structure. And the coronary sinus is completely roofed and not dilated. So we sweep posteriorly or tail up first and then we sweep anteriorly, opening up the AD valves and then aorta and then the pulmonary artery. The next important structure which we see here is the membranous septum. The membranous septum is the septum which is present between the tricuspid valve and the aortic valve. It's a very small area, approximately 5 millimeters in an adult. So in a child, it's going to be even more smaller. And then when we lose the membranous septum, we open up the aortic valve completely, seeing subaortic defects. And then as we go anteriorly, we will open up the pulmonary valve from the right ventricle. And from the right ventricle, we open the pulmonary valve. This area is the subpulmonic area. The rest of the septum is going to be trabecular septum. Again, the posterior, mid, and anterior septums can be seen as we sweep. And the superior, middle, and inferior septum can also be seen. This part, which is below the AV valve, is going to be the inlet area. Now, four chamber view also is important because it helps us define the atrial situs. How do we define the atrial situs? Primarily based on the appendage, the fossa ovalis. Basically, the if you have a flap of foramen oval, it flaps into the left atrium and the pulmonary veins. It said three or more than three veins separately entering into the left atrium defines it as, I mean, separately entering into an atrium defines it as left atrium. It also helps us defining the ventricles. Remember the AV valves always go with the ventricles. And how do we define the ventricles? As we see the left ventricle is more smooth and right ventricle is more trabeculated. It has this prominent muscle bundle which is seen which is the moderator band. It's very well seen in subcostals and apical. And the AV valves, the mitral valve does not like the septum. It has attachment to the papillary muscles which are away from the septum, whereas the tricuspid valve likes the septum. It hugs the septum. 
So based on the AV valve morphology and the ventricular morphology, you define your ventricles and then you say whether it's atrioventricular concordant. Also, the parts of the mitral leaflet, this is the anterior mitral leaflet, this is the posterior mitral leaflet. And for the tricuspid valve, the two leaflets which we are seeing here are the anterior tricuspid leaflet and the septal tricuspid leaflet. The aortic valve, as we open up here, what we are seeing is the right and the non-coronary cusp in this view. Now, from this view, when we are sweeping, we are sweeping with tail down, but sometimes a little bit we are rotating the probe clockwise. So, same thing, we will do it on color and we double check everything. We double check the pulmonary veins, we double check the interatrial septum, the tricuspid regurgitation, the mitral valve, the inlet area, the membranous septum, the subaortic septum, the subpulmonic septum and the trabecular septum. Remember the great vessels always cross each other. If the great vessels are not crossing, it's not normal. So at the end of it, when we finish the apical view, before we leave, we rotate the probe anticlockwise. So what happens if we rotate the probe anticlockwise? So this is how the probe looks. If we rotate the probe anti-clockwise from uh, sort of towards the left elbow, we rotate it towards the left shoulder. And what we get is a two-chamber view of the heart. So this is the fourth chamber. You're rotating anti-clockwise and you get a two-chambered view. The two-chambered view is very important because it shows different components of the mitral valve. As we know, the mitral valve has the anterior and the posterior uh, mitral leaflet, and it has three scallops individually, the A1, A2, A3, P1, P2, P3. And you see different parts in this view, plus the left atrial appendage. See how beautifully the left atrial appendage opens up in a two-chamber view. So the mitral valve morphology, mitral, when, whenever you have mitral regurgitation or prolapse, you can define the mitral valve better and the left atrial appendage can be more better defined in addition to your pulmonary veins. So this is the two-chamber view. And after finishing the apical, what we are going to get is, so this is the apical and then we further go down the two-chamber view. And after that, we go a little high to the parasternal view. Now, the parasternal view is a little difficult to understand because it is not the way the heart we look at. However, it is very important because it's the only view which cuts the heart across the axis of the heart. So, it's considered the long axis view where you want to cut the heart across the axis and you know that the apex is here and the base is here. So you put your probe across the long axis of the heart with the cursor towards the right shoulder. The cursor is towards the right shoulder. This is the long axis of the heart or it's called the parasternal long axis. And you will have multiple sweeps again from tail down to tail up. Now, how is it going to cut the heart? Long axis. So here, the understanding of right left is a little distorted. This is one view where Right is not right and left is not left. So what happens? This is the apex of the heart and this is the base of the heart. My structures which are here are relatively anterior and here are relatively posterior. And my sweep is also from posterior to anterior. So here this view, you cannot clearly get what is right, what is left in one single section. Let us see when, when we have the sweep, how it looks. So coming to the Pariston long axis. So we can see here, this is the long axis of the heart. The long axis means you open up the LA, LV and aorta. Why do we open up all three in one plane? We are able to do that because the left ventricle does not have a conus normally. Unlike the right ventricle, the right ventricle has a conus because of which you cannot open up the RA, RV and PA in the same view. So this is the LA, LV and aorta. So now let's see what is it. This is the apex and this is the base. But relatively, this is left, this is right and Though I am 
anterior posterior, my sweep is also from posterior to anterior. So when I get the long axis, how do you get the long axis? Put your probe across the long axis of the heart, but your view is correct when you have the aorta and the IVS in one line. So it should be parallel. If your heart is tilting, then you have to manipulate your probe in a such a way that you get this, the interventricular septum and the anterior wall of aorta in one line. Once you get that, what you do is you start sweeping. You start sweeping and you go posterior. So when you posterior, that is tail up, you open up the tricuspid valve. So tricuspid valve is posterior and the pulmonary valve is anterior. This is the tricuspid valve. This is the pulmonary valve. And what, what uh, the aortic valve has is the right coronary cusp and the non-coronary cusp. The RCC is the anterior one and the NCC is the posterior one. The leaflet which you see here closer to the aortic valve of the mitral glass is the anterior mitral leaflet and this is the posterior mitral leaflet. See that when you go posteriorly, you are seeing the coronary sinus again in this view, which is also uh, a way to check that the CS is not dilated and it's roofed. You see this is the anterior aortic wall and this is the posterior aortic wall. This is the ascending aorta. These are the sinuses of the aortic wall and this is the pulmonary artery, the pulmonary valve and the main pulmonary artery. This is the tricuspid valve. That's the pulmonary valve. So the defects which are seen just below the aortic valve in this view are the subaortic defects. The perimembranous defect is most of the time seen when you sweep posterior and open up the tricuspid valve. You see a defect, it's the membranous defect. But what happens when you see a defect, you open up the pulmonary valve? That's the outlet or the subpulmonic defect or the supracrystal defect. The rest of the septum is going to be the trabecular septum. The trabecular septum will, will be again the upper, mid, and lower. And when you sleep from the tricuspid valve to the pulmonary valve, those are the posterior to the anterior defects. Also remember that you see the descending aorta in short axis when you open up the pulmonary valve. This is the descending aorta in long axis. So this is a view where you open up the main pulmonary artery and aorta in the same view. You can see aorta pulmonary defect, you can see PDAs. Sometimes you can even suspect a coarct on color. The coronaries are seen when you uh, open up the interventricular septum, but then the parastinal short axis would be a better view to see that. Now we double check everything on long axis. And we can see here, we start with the long axis, the aortic valve, make sure there's no aortic regurgitation. That was the pulmonary valve and the main pulmonary artery. This is the tricuspid inflow. And then we sweep. <clears throat> While sweeping, we put the color box throughout the interventricular septum. We also see the mitral valve. We see the descending aorta in short axis here. And when we see the long axis, we open up the descending aorta this way. The main pulmonary artery and the descending aorta are seen in the same view. One very important understanding in this view is whenever the pulmonary artery bifurcates, the one which goes this side is the left pulmonary artery. Never ever misunderstand that because the left pulmonary artery and the descending aorta open up together. This is a view where you can open up the ductus very well. Now what happens after this? After this, we rotate our probe in a way that we get the short axis. In any type of a study on echo, whether it's a TEE, whether it's a fetal, whether it's transthoracic, remember that to come from long to short, you have to rotate the probe 90 degrees. So we knew that we were the cursor towards the right shoulder. We rotate clockwise 90 degrees and we get the cursor towards the left shoulder. This is the short axis axis of the heart. So you are cutting the heart in an axial plane. In an axial plane, the understanding is a little more simpler. This is right and this is left. And you are at the base of the heart, you're going to sweep towards the apex of the heart. This is anterior and this is posterior. So right, left, anterior, posterior, and your sweep is from the base to the 
apex of the heart. So we can see here the aortic valve in short axis. You start at the level of the base of the heart. So what you have is great vessels. You see the aortic valve and you see the pulmonary valve. Remember that RV has a conus. So the right side of the heart takes one full turn surrounding the aortic valve. So the aortic valve, RA, RV, and PA. So it's like a circle and a sausage type of a appearance. And also that the pulmonary artery, you can see the bifurcation, the right and the left. And then when you sweep towards the apex of the heart, you will come down to the ventricles, the LV and the RV. The RV is anterior, the LV is posterior. Also that we have all the four AV valves, though not in the same section. As you see, you see the aorta and the pulmonary artery. And when you sweep, you see the mitral and the tricuspid. So in a particular view, actually all four are together and parasitic short axis gives us an understanding of lots of things, different types of VSDs, the coronaries, etc. So we'll try to freeze and then have an understanding. So this is the aortic valve. This is the tricuspid valve and this is the pulmonary valve. So the septum which is close to the tricuspid valve is the membranous septum. The septum which is here, 12 o'clock is the subaortic or the infracrystal septum. And the one which is close to the pulmonary valve is the supracrystal septum or the subpulmonic septum. The crystal supraventricularis comes here. So the membranous septum, the subaortic septum, the subpulmonic septum. Remember that the inlet septum is not seen in this, the muscular septum is not seen in this till you start your sweep. This is the interatrial septum. This is the left atrium, the right atrium, the right ventricle, and the outflow. The left atrium will show the right lower and the left lower pulmonary veins before you start your sleep. The interatrial septum, or a little rotation, you might see the IVC entering the right atrium. And then, once you start your sleep, you will see the left coronary artery. The left coronary artery bifurcating into LAD and CERC and the right coronary artery. To get the coronaries, you might need to rotate the probe a little clockwise to get from the RCC to the LCC. And what you see here is the main pulmonary artery, the pulmonary valve, the right and the left pulmonary artery. Here, right is right, left is left. And you will see the descending aorta together in short axis. So the duct is also going to be opening up. Also that the cusps which are seen, the right, the left, and the non-coronary cusp. The non is the posterior cusp. The right is the right, the left is the left. The right and the left are a little more anterior compared to the non-coronary cusp. The pulmonary valve does not come in a short axis in this view. Also that the, the pulmonary artery is taking sort of a turn surrounding the aorta. And when you start sweeping, you see the Left ventricles, the first structure which you're going to see is the mitral valve. And the mitral valve is seen as a fish mouth appearance. So that's the mitral valve, fish mouth appearance, the cordy, and the two papillary muscles. So make sure you have two papillary muscles. And the interventricular septum, the trabecular septum, will be seen at different levels. If you see a VSD at the level of mitral valve, very likely it's going to be an inlet VSD in this view. And also the morphology of the ventricle, the left ventricle being smooth and slipper shape, and the right ventricle being more trabeculated. Now, all these things we have come from the papillary muscle, the one which is anterior is the entrolateral papillary muscle, the one which is posterior is the postromedial papillary muscle. So, with this understanding, you will confirm everything then on color. And everything is confirmed on color as we see the right and the left pulmonary artery, the descending aorta here, the pulmonary veins entering, and then the interventricular septum. Now, at the end of the short axis, what is remaining now is we need to go a still further up and get what is called the suprasternal view. Okay, before we go there, this is a modified parasternal. If you put the probe after the short axis, into the right parasternal, we will get a right parasternal window.
This right pedestal window is important in children, not commonly used in adults. And why is it important? Because the interatrial septal defect, sometimes the subcostal windows are not very good. Then we can use this to define our rims, size, etc. Now here we can see this is very similar to our subcostal sagittal view. And the probe is actually put on the right parasternal border. And what you get is the SVC and IVC. This is left atrium, this is right atrium. This is the SVC and this is the IVC. So beautifully you can see the IVC flow, the SVC flow. This view is very important, especially before de deciding the device suitability and deciding before the device, because the IVC rim is beautifully seen in this view, even if you have no subcostal windows. So now finishing this, we will go to the uh, suprasternal windows. Now suprasternal windows, so suprasternals, you put the cursor, you put the probe on the suprasternal area with the cursor towards the chin. The cursor is towards the chin. Now in suprasternals, you can see here, you can use the word like long axis or short axis because that's how it's cutting the heart, but it's only uh, very limited to the base of the heart. It's more related to the great vessels of the heart. So the suprasternal long axis where the cursor is towards the chin, and this is superior, this is inferior, and your sweep is from right to left. So suprasternal long axis, if you have your sweep from right to left, sorry, this is how you will open up the aorta across its length. So this is the long axis, the suprasternal long axis, where you open up the aorta. So you have a part of ascending aorta, a significant part of the transverse arch, a significant part of the transverse arch. You can see the great vessels coming and the aorta, the descending aorta. So the whole arch is very well defined in this view, including the isthmus. And you can uh, sweep from right to left to open up the individual arch vessels. The, air, the right primary artery comes as a cross section under the arch and a structure below the right primary artery is actually the left atrium, which you can sometimes see with individual primary veins. And if it's a right arch, the arch is going to be a little on the right. How do we define it? We define it based on the position of the trachea. So if, a, if the arch is to the left of the trachea, it's the left arch. The arch to the right of the trachea is the right arch. However, the mirror image concept for the right arch sometimes works, sometimes does not work. So use trachea more to define it, whether it's a right arch or a left arch. The SVC will come to the right side of the arch and the left innominate vein will go above. Sometimes the left innominate vein is retroaortic, then it's going to go below the arch in this view. The same thing, you can double check it on color and what you will see is, sorry, the ascending aorta, the arch vessels, the isthmus, the descending aorta, the right pulmonary artery in the cross section and the SVC towards the right side of the aorta. Now, rotating the probe completely 90 degrees from here, as we understood, we are going to go to the short axis, rotate the probe 90 degrees, the cursor towards the left side of the baby, the cursor towards the left side of the baby, from towards the chin, towards the left side of the baby, and then our sleep is from interior to posterior, right is right, left is left. And what we are getting is a suprasternal short axis view. The suprasternal short axis view, we see the same aorta in a short axis. We see the RP in its length. This is the SVC towards the right side. So the RP is in its length. You can open up the left pulmonary artery and the LA is in the lower part. This is the crab view when we open up the pulmonary veins individually. And you can see the same thing on color with the aorta, the right and the left, pulmonary artery, the SVC, the left in nominate, and the left atrium with four pulmonary veins separately entering into the left atrium. So now this is the suprasternal uh, uh, view. 
And at the end of understanding of all the 2Ds and colors, wherever possible, whenever possible, we would try to measure the uh, measurements of multiple things, including the tricuspid, the mitral, pulmonary, aortic, and also the aortic arch, etc. Remember that AV valves are measured in diastole, similar valves are measured in systole, the pulmonary arteries and aorta, etc., they are measured in systole. So you have charts available with minus two standard deviation, plus two standard deviation measurements, and then that is going to give you understanding whether your measurements are okay or not. We will see a little about M mode and Doppler before we finish it. And what all structures should we uh, use M mode on? Now, this is the IVC M mode. Why do we do it? One is it tells you the size of the IVC in relation to the aorta. Second, it tells you whether it's collapsing or not. Now, normally you have uh, a collapsibility and you have definitions how to define the collapsibility, which is less than 50%, more than 50% to define if your right atrial pressures are high. And so this is how you would uh, put, put across the cursor across the IVC and find on M mode whether it's collapsible or not. The second structure which you're going to commonly do an M mode on is in the parasitic long axis across the LA and aorta. Remember here, again, the interventricular septum and the anterior ascending. What you're seeing is the aorta and the left atrium. And normally the acceptable ratio is between 1 is to uh, 1.2. Uh, so that means the left atrium can be 1.2 times bigger than the aorta and anything more than that is abnormal. You will see the, uh, the way you measure it at what part of the cardiac cycle is important and the ratio is considered important for multiple uh, structural issues. The next most important thing is the LV. Now you can take an M mode of LV in long axis or in short axis. Both the views are acceptable, but remember at what level you are cutting. You should ideally cut at the tip of the leaflet or at the level of cordy before you get the papillary muscle. So you will have nothing inside the cavity uh, when you do an M mode, and what you get is a part of the RV cavity interiorly, and then it starts with the interventricular septum. You get the LV cavity and you get the posterior wall of the LV. And then this is the diastole and this is the systole. Your measurements are usually uh, taken in diastole for the interventricular septum and the posterior wall, but you will have to take uh, uh, check the function, the systolic function, which you can do it in this view. Most of the machines are capable of doing it, but you can manually also calculate based on the volumes. You can calculate the ejection fraction or based on the dimensions, you can calculate the fractional shortening. And you have also sometimes the software available in the machine which calculates the mass of the LV. So at the end of this, what you get is the dimensions, the volumes, the function, and the mass. Uh, so this is how you will cut it. And remember, your interventricular septum has to be completely horizontal to get an ideal measurement. The next uh, M mode is across the aortic and the mitral valve. Now here we can see you take the aortic valve short axis and you put a cursor across it. And what you're getting here is the aortic M mode where you can see here the aortic leaflets are well seen. Sometimes the RCC is much better seen than the NCC because these leaflets are not in the same plane. And what you can see is sort of a box-shaped appearance of the aortic valve. In systole, it opens up, and in diastole, you can see the fusion, complete fusion of the leaflet. So this is a box-shaped appearance on a mode. Why is it important? We will see it maybe in the future classes. Things like bicuspid aortic valve, etc., will have a different appearance. The mitral valve, the mitral valve M mode, what happens when you cut the mitral valve across with a cursor using the M mode? Now, this is very similar to what you will see on a Doppler pattern, and the waves are actually defined in, defined in a similar way. You have the E and the A. Now, actually, when the starting happens, it's actually D, E, F, A, B, and C. So the A is the second peak, the E is the first peak. This is the first part of the diastole. This is the second part of the diastole. And this is the anterior mitral leaflet moving. You can also see the posterior mitral leaflet moving. So this is how an M mode looks like. And you can define your systole and diastole even based on this. Now, the last M mode is of the pulmonary valve. And if you do an M mode of the pulmonary valve, you can see here the pulmonary valve leaflets. And 
you can see here the uh, during the point where the right atrium contracts this is the a point on m mode and the a point is the ventricular diastole the ventricular diastole is seen as an a point where the right atrium actually pushes during its contraction so this is the m mode of the pulmonary valve coming to the dopplers the most important in pediatrics when you start your subcostals do not forget to doppler your descending aorta at the diaphragm make sure your pulsatility systolic pulsations a little continuation diastole but not throughout the diastole is important to rule out low thoracic or abdominal coax the velocity the peak velocity is important the way the wave is formed and your diastolic flow the lower flow is simultaneous ivc flow which is picked up along with the descending aortic flow the ivc flow looks like this now ivc is a smooth continuous phasic flow like a venous flow with no pulsations in it and it's a phasic when you say word phasic it means that during respiratory uh, variations you can appreciate that during inspiration and expiration there is a change in the peak velocity usually the peak velocity is not more than 0.5 meters per second now this is the svc flow we can very well see the s the d and the a wave so the s wave is in ventricular systole the d wave is during ventricular diastole this is the earlier part of the diastole and the a wave is the reversal the reversal due to atrial kick and remember that the s wave is more than the d wave in svc and the a wave is a small wave which is seen as a reverse wave now what happens during inspiration in svc is the s and the d wave increases in inspiration and the a wave reduces in inspiration the hepatic veins you can sometimes see an additional wave now here we can see the hepatic veins they are entering into the heart so the one which is below the baseline is the s and the d wave and the a wave is a negative wave now sometimes you may see an additional a wave v wave in addition to the a wave in a negative wave here so this is the hepatic venous flow this is the forward flow this is the reverse flow some change in the very uh, respiration in terms of velocity is well seen this is the mitral valve the mitral valve is typically having the doppler pattern which was similar to the m mode pattern and here you have the e and the a wave remember that when you do it in the neonate early time after birth the e a wave ratio might be equal or reversed now the mitral valve e and a wave also shows changes in respiration but it's not as significant as the tricuspid valve and the mitral valve change in the respiration what happens that during inspiration the velocity increases but amongst the e and the a it's the e wave velocity which reduces and the a wave velocity does not change because of which what happens in inspiration is the e a ratio reduces and in mitral valve you actually can trace it to get the mean gradient you can get the e and the a wave velocity you can get the pressure half time by putting a cursor from the peak e to the end of e and you can also get the deceleration time so these are few things which you get on doppler of the mitral valve in a similar way you get it for the tricuspid valve also remember that the tricuspid valve respiratory changes as you can see here they are marked marked in the sense that during inspiration the velocity increases during expiration the velocity reduces but actually what happens the e wave velocity increases on inspiration the a wave also increases because of which the e a ratio remains unchanged overall but the overall velocity increases in inspiration the tricuspid regurgitation jet gradients can be obtained in the four chamber a piper and this in addition to the ra pressures will give you an idea about the rv pressures or the pulmonary artery pressures in absence of rvot obstruction the tissue doppler also has to be done can be done for understanding of ra pressures and rv diastolic function where you can have put a cursor towards the free uh, uh, the the free wall or the anterior tricuspid leaflet and the septal tricuspid leaflet you will get the e and the a wave and if you compare the e wave on the normal doppler and the e wave on the tissue doppler you can get an understanding of the ra pressures 
the aortic valve has a single systolic flow, but uh, you can get multiple measurements again here. On the aortic valve, you put a cursor and trace it. What you will get is a mean gradient, the peak gradient, and the velocity time integral. What do you mean by velocity time integral? It's a combination, it's a multiplication of the mean velocity and the duration taken, which is called the VTI. And also one of, of another important index is the acceleration time. You put a cursor towards the beginning and towards the peak of the wave. That is what is the acceleration time. Now the aortic valve and the pulmonary valve, you have a similar way. You can get a peak gradient. The mean gradients do not have much understanding on the pulmonary side. And if you put a doctor in the ascending aorta in the main pulmonary artery, you can see here some amount of reversal of flow which is seen, which is because some flow goes back and hits the valve, the similar valve, during the earlier part of diastole. So this is the doctor across the aortic uh, ascending aorta and the main pulmonary artery. There are measurements in terms of IV artery or myocardial performance, uh, performance index, which can be taken, which is a good way to understand the systolic and the diastolic function, and it can be done along with the ECG leads, which defines the exact duration of IVRT. So IVRT is at the end of the aortic flow and beginning of the mitral flow. So that is the isovolumic relaxation time. So at the end of it, I think we will end up our talk um, understanding that whenever you are trying to do an echo, remember what are the indications for the study. Keep addressing issues that will help you managing the child. Always do complete sweeps on 2D and color. Also pay attention to the surrounding vascular structures, the mediastinum, the diaphragm, and the pleural cavity. Thank you so much for your patient listening. If you have any questions, please feel free to.